Hello, hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of Muscle for Life. I'm your host, Mike Matthews. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's interview with Menno Henselmans on full body training. And this is something that I have been getting asked about more and more, especially over the last six months or so, as full body training has become the split du jour. So back in 2000, 2012, when I first published Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, the first edition, bro splits, body part splits were the most popular way to lift weights. That's how most everyday gym goers thought about weightlifting. And the program, BLS 1.0, was a body part split of sorts. It was more like a push pull legs with a couple of body part days on top of it. So it was a push day, a pull day, a legs day, and an arm arms day and a shoulders day, right? So it's kind of a hybrid between PPL and the body part, the traditional bodybuilder body part split. Fast forward to today, BLS 3.0 and the program is similar to 1.0, although it is now, let's say, push-pull legs with some upper and lower mixed in. So I would say it's more of a hybrid now between PPL and upper-lower. And I've spoken about this in previous episodes, and I've written about it as well, that the split that you are following isn't nearly as important as what you are doing in the gym, particularly in terms of volume, so number of hard sets, per major muscle group per week. And frequency matters to a degree as well. It's mostly a tool for volume. It's mostly a way to make sure that you are getting in enough volume. And then of course you have intensity, making sure that you are lifting heavy enough weights. So anything over 60 to 65% of one rep max is where it starts to get fun and it starts to get effective. And you can go all the way up to 95% or even 100% of one rep max, depending on what you're doing. That said, when you program your training properly, it is going to resemble one type of split more than another. So you might take an upper lower base and add a full body day. So you might have upper lower upper and then do a full body workout. And then you might do a body part workout. Maybe your arms really need some work. So you have your final day of your fifth day of the week, an arms day, or you might start with a push pull legs base and add an upper body day in addition to it, or a lower body day in addition to it, or a full body day or two full body days and so forth. And all of that can work just fine in terms of bottom line results. You might prefer one setup over another for mostly subjective reasons, but anyone who knows how to program effectively would agree that you don't have to stick to just one type of split. You can create a mashup that gives you the volume that you want for each major muscle group and allows for the exercise size selection you want and allows you to prioritize the muscle groups you want to prioritize in your training and so forth. And today's guest Menno would agree with that. However, when does it make sense to mostly do full body training or even exclusively do full body training? So where every workout is a full body workout. Well, that in particular is what I talk with Menno about in this episode. And in case you're not familiar with Menno, he is a repeat guest here in Muscle for Life. I've had him on several times and he's one of the more requested guests that I get for repeat interviews. But in case you are not familiar with Menno, he is a bodybuilding coach, writer, and published scientist who is also on the scientific advisory board of my sports nutrition company, Legion. And in this episode, we discuss quite a few aspects of full body training. You'll hear from Menno on why he thinks you should use a full body split if you train infrequently. He goes over the primary benefits of full body training as they relate to volume and work capacity in particular. He talks about how he likes to properly program supersets. And I put those in air quotes because as you will hear in this episode, they're not, he doesn't do it the way that many people do it. And by doing it his way, it allows you to get your workouts done faster without hurting your performance on the different exercises that you got to get done. Menno also shares his thoughts on how to best program a full body routine and more. So if you are currently doing full body training, or if you have been considering it, or if you would just like to hear about what it may be able to do for you, then this episode's for you. 
Also, if you like what I'm doing here on the podcast and elsewhere, definitely check out my health and fitness books, including the number one best-selling weightlifting books for men and women in the world, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, as well as the leading flexible dieting cookbook, The Shredded Chef. Now, these books have sold well over 1 million copies and have helped thousands of people build their best body ever. And you can find them on all major online retailers like Audible, Amazon, iTunes, Kobo, and Google Play, as well as in select Barnes and Noble stores. And I should also mention that you can get any of the audio books 100% free when you sign up for an Audible account. And this is a great way to make those pockets of downtime like commuting, meal prepping, and cleaning more interesting, entertaining, and productive. And so if you want to take Audible up on this offer, and if you want to get one of my audio books for free, just go to www.buylegion, that's B-U-Y, legion.com slash audible and sign up for your account. So again, if you appreciate my work and if you want to see more of it, and if you want to learn time-proven and evidence-based strategies for losing fat, building muscle, and getting healthy, and strategies that work for anyone and everyone, regardless of age or circumstances, please do consider picking up one of my best-selling books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger for Men, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger for Women, and The Shredded Chef for my favorite fitness-friendly recipes. Hey, Menno, welcome back to my podcast, man. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Hey, my pleasure. We got uh, great feedback on the last ones, especially the one we did on muscular potential. So uh, happy to be back. Yeah, I uh, heard from quite a few people that uh, about that one as well and asking, when are you going to come back? So here we are. Excellent. Let's talk. Yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about full body training, which is something that I spoke briefly about, I want to say a couple of months ago, I do a series of episodes that I call says you. And basically I ask really just on Instagram, I ask people who follow me to tell me what they disagree with me about. And then I Mm -hmm. pick some of the things that people say that I think would just make for interesting discussion. And I turn a few of those points into just kind of like monologues where I address each of them. And one of them was regarding splits and an upper lower versus a full body. And so I shared some of my thoughts regarding full body training as well as some of my personal experience, but it's not something that I've gone into in too much detail. And I know that you have written and spoken a lot about full body training and have more experience with it than I do really. So I thought you'd be a great person to have that discussion with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a lot of experience with full body training or a in general with uh, high frequency training. Yeah, exactly. So I think we could just start with a definition so people understand what we're talking about here. Like what qualifies as a full body workout or a full body split versus something else? Yeah. I mean, when you talk about full body training, mostly it just refers to literally training every muscle group in the body, every major muscle group that you want to train, you're training it basically every time you're in the gym. And it's good to, I think, talk about Training frequency, mostly, because, you know, when you say, well, full body training, that can mean you're training twice a week and two of those sessions are full body, which I think that most people would agree with that if you train twice a week or even three times a week, you should probably do full body because if you do a split, then you're going to hit every muscle group very often only once a week. That is most likely based on basic, almost all the data we have, uh, not going to be optimal once you're past the, the novice stages. And just to clarify there, I'm curious your take on it, but is that mostly because of the issue with volume where you just need a certain amount of volume after your newbie gains are exhausted to continue gaining muscle and strength? And let's say it's 15 hard sets per major muscle group per week, and you can't do that in one training session because after nine or 10 sets or so, you hit that point of diminishing returns. And so you have to split them up. Yeah. There's basically three reasons why that doesn't work well, neither in theory nor in practice. And that's A, there seems to be a fundamental limit on how much muscle growth or how long you can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Like after a session, you're going to grow, but you're not going to grow for like a month. You know, you're not going to be able to do. If only. You you can do like 50 sets and then just spend the rest of the month on the couch getting jacked, you know. (laughs) So (laughs) clearly there is a limit to how long you can grow after a single workout. And especially based on data on muscle protein synthesis. And if we reconcile that with like training frequency literature and 
strength training individuals, that's probably going to be less than a week, more like three days for like advanced individuals, for a little bit less advanced individuals, and maybe up to a week or so, but probably not, right. uh, not really more than that. And then problem B is uh, even if you can grow for that, that period, it's going to require very high volume. And as you already touched on, most uh, or there are several lines of research based, again, on, on muscle protein synthesis and also in direct training frequency studies that point to there being basically a maximum productive session volume. So that's going to lie. It's not very clear where that lies, and it depends a bit on whether you regard the, the very contentious and um, how do you say it? There have been concerns about the data validity of some of the, the work of some Brazilian researchers, uh, namely Paulo Gentil and the Babalio studies. But depending on how seriously you take those, the limit is, is probably going to be around 10 sets, roughly, like maybe 15. Based on like MPS data, it's probably going to be more like 10 sets. If you exceed that threshold, you're not actually going to stimulate much more extra protein synthesis, it seems. That's basically just the cap. You know, like your body gets the hint, it wants to grow. There's just a limit on, on how much you can stimulate it to grow in one workout, you know? And then three, let's say that volume is all you need. So, you know, maybe you don't need more than, say, those 10 sets in your case. Even if you do that, it, it's quite hard to do 10 productive sets, like actually very productive sets for one muscle group. It's also going to take a lot of time because you need, you know, several minutes rest in between all of those. Whereas for full body training, you can train with much shorter rest periods because you can do bench press and then you can do a set of chin-ups and then you can do a set of squats. And you don't need a full five minutes between each of those. But if you, you know, do 10 sets like bench press, fly, dumbbell bench press, and then machine pack fly or whatever, then your work capacity is going to tank pretty hard by the time you, you get to like over five sets. Really do. I mean, I would say that I actually, I haven't experienced too much of that personally. And having worked with many, many people over the years, a lot of new people, a lot of people new to proper weightlifting, I would say that my personal experience, my experience working with many others is that a workout of nine or 10 sets is, they definitely, they have worked out by the end of it. But even in the case of lower body it's not too bad. It's not too grueling. And maybe 10 sets of bench press might be a bit obnoxious for the final few sets, but where you're starting with a compound movement, maybe even heavier weight on the compound, and then you're working maybe in a higher rep range with some accessory exercises toward the end of the workout has seemed to work fairly well. You know, I'm talking about work capacity in the actual, the objective sense of the words, literally work output. So mentally it can be uh, easier often i mean if you do in general if you do like chest workouts that's easy compared to like squats you know like you can do 10 sets of chest and it's still going to be probably easier than two sets of hard squats so there's basically you know if you're a hard trainee there's basically no such thing as a hard biceps exercise it's just something you can do like in your sleep basically so work capacity though in the sense of the, the physical definition like work output reps times weight times sets that's gonna tank like there's just basically some women can, can tolerate high volumes very well that way, but your performance is going to decrease. Like, basically, you can say if your performance is not decreasing, then you really have to question your training efforts. If you've done 10 sets and your performance is still the same as it was before those 10 sets, then you know, you're simply not training hard. For a lot of people, it doesn't really feel that way if you have multiple exercises, because if you always do like chest day and your flies are always your last exercise and you're used to using you know, 30 pounds or 40 pounds, whatever, on fly sets of 15 and then you know it's going to be maybe 15 reps 14 reps 13 reps then you think oh that's that looks fine the work capacity for that is okay but now put those flies on its separate day on friday instead of monday and suddenly you see hey now i can use instead of those 40 pounds i can actually use 50 pounds so that's a 25 percent increase in work capacity and total weekly training tonnage lifted just for moving that exercise to a different day with exactly the same effort so that's what I mean by my work capacity. Like you're you're going to do more volume for the same amount of sets, but spread out across the week. Because in, in essence, training frequency is, is basically the same effect as a rest interval. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I guess I was looking at more from the perspective of bottom line results. Like you could take, and I'm sure, I mean, you know this, you've worked with a lot, so many people over the years as well. You could take somebody who's new to proper weightlifting and you could put them, not that it's necessarily optimal, but you could put them on a simple body part split where they're doing 
10, 9, 10 hard sets for one major muscle group in a workout. And let's say it's chest and then it's back and then it's shoulders and legs and arms. And that person can do quite well for probably the first year or so, I don't know, eight months or a year or so just simply because they're so hyper responsive. And if you could take a guy and if he can gain his first 20 ish pounds of muscle that way, well, then I would say that you're probably not going to beat that no matter what else you do, right? You're not going to take that guy and put 30 pounds on him by getting fancy with the programming. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's now a lot of research, I think 12 studies on untrained individuals that look at training frequency. And there are two that find benefits. But 10 that say, you know, it doesn't really matter what your training frequency is. For an untrained individual, at least over the course of the first couple of months, you can train once a week, you can train three times a week, which means, you know, you can do like three times full body or just one chest day, and you're going to get basically the same results. And for a lot of training variables just in untrained individuals, it's basically the case that you're still so sensitive to, to, to anabolic stimuli when you're, you're untrained. There's even some research, for example, that shows that in like the first weeks of training, Bicycling, some relatively high intensity bicycling, actually also maximizes muscle growth. Now, if you if you do that over somewhat longer study durations, then strength training generally wins out. But like the first few weeks, you can also see this if you look at like molecular signaling studies. The training stimulus of like squats and a bicycle ergometer workouts are very similar in an untrained individual. Like the squat is also going to stimulate robust endurance training adaptations, and the bicycle work is actually going to stimulate a significant muscle growth. Within a course of a couple of weeks, that, that difference majorly changes. But the problem is, you know, that we don't know how long that discrepancy keeps going and how much more important many of these variables become once you get, you know, not, not like intermediate, but like 10 years of lifting. Because there we have very little research. But if we look specifically at that group, interestingly, Kruger had a study on rugby players, the Norwegian Frequency Study, Norwegian Frequency Project was in national level powerlifters. Hakinen from Finland, I believe, has two or three studies on like powerlifters, bodybuilders, and Olympic weightlifters. There's also one study on like female athletes from I think that same research group. And they all find significant benefits. So if you look at like the highest echelon of training advancement, then the training frequency research becomes a lot more positive. Whereas in untrained individuals, like I said, there is there's basically a consensus that training frequency really doesn't matter much. Yeah, that makes sense. And bringing it back to full body then, so would you say that one of the main reasons to do full body training is to get in more high quality volume? Yes, definitely. And uh, so when I started promoting high frequency training, the literature was far more compelling in favor of high frequency training. But now it seems that most of the benefits, if not for, you know, beyond when you're training at least twice a week, most of the benefit, if not all the benefit, comes from your higher total work output. And then some people will say, well, you know, it's, it's just that you're doing more work. You can also say that for rest intervals. You can say that for most advanced training techniques, they work because they allow you to do more work, no pun intended. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's the mechanism, but it is a real benefit. And I'd say it's also very practical because like I said, full body workouts can help you take advantage of uh, circuit training, antagonist supersets, uh, or just stringing up exercise together, which I call combo sets, which are not strictly doing a superset. You do rest in between, but not as much as you would need between like two sets of bench presses. So it's, it's very time effective. And you can take advantage of many of those techniques. And also in a, in a crowded gym, you can see like, oh, if I can't do this exercise, I'll just do the other one. Whereas yeah. if you, you have to do the bench press before chest flies, then if you have to do chest flies beforehand, that's a bit of a different topic, but pre-exhausting is generally a bad idea. So let's talk about some of those details just for people wondering. So if you were going to do a superset, although it's, you know, the antagonist paired set is a better term, what do you mean exactly and how would you do that so you're not impairing your performance on either of the exercises? Yeah, and an, an antagonist superset is when you're doing two basically opposite movements back to back. And then performance does not, not only not decrease, it actually increases because of antagonist uh, inhibition. There seems to be some fatigue in muscles, basically makes the muscles with the opposite function perform better because they are less inhibited. So basically, whenever you're flexing your biceps, for example, your triceps also co-contract. So it's also flexing. 
of course, to a much lesser degree, but it's needed as a stabilizer. And the dynamic between those two muscles determines how much effective force output there is. Now, it appears that some kind of fatigue in, say, the triceps makes your biceps perform better. And it's not because the triceps is just contracting less hard. It's also been looked at. So there's no reduction in antagonist co-activation, to put it formally. Uh, the triceps is still doing the same thing. But there actually seems to be some neuromuscular improvement, which is still debated what the exact mechanism is, in the biceps. So if you do concretely, the order matters here. If you do bench presses, and then immediately after, you do a set of cable rows, which is, if you think about it, you know, sort of the opposite movement pattern and trains sort of the opposite muscles, then your performance on the rows is actually going to improve. And some research even finds that if you do this across multiple sets, then your performance on the bench press might also increase. But it's mainly the second exercise. And it seems that it's slow twitch muscles that you have to do second to get the most benefit. Because if you do, interestingly, if you do leg curls and then leg extension straight after, you're going to get a pretty significant benefit. But if you do leg extensions and then leg curls, the leg curls don't seem to really benefit from that. Interesting. And when you say immediately after, you mean immediately? Not even like a, a 60 second rest period in between? Let's say it's the bench press and it's the rows? Yeah, 60 second actually you hit the, it's on the money. You need to be within 60 seconds to actually get the, the potentiating effect. The muscle spindles or whatever the exact mechanism is seem to basically be uh, in an altered state for about 60 seconds. Now, okay. if you miss that window, it's not the end of the world because you're, you know, you're still going to have the same performance as normal. It won't be impaired, but you won't get that extra performance. And so when you're doing it, do you like to put some rest in between those exercises just to let your, I don't know, heart rate come down a little bit or do you just go straight into it? Yeah. It's, I mean, in practice with these things, I don't implement them very strictly because unless you, you own the gym or like one of the only ones there or, you know, the leg extension and leg curl are like right next to each other. This is actually one example where in the gym that does often, that is often quite the case or quite often the case. But for most exercises, like the bench press and the cable row, they can be quite far apart. And you may not be able to confiscate both of them, you know? That's what, that's what a gym bag is for. You're yeah. one of those people. You drop your bag on the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Or you just cough these days and then everyone's gone in, yeah. uh, in a white margin. Yeah, yeah just... <laughs> yeah, you just go and quickly cough on whatever you're going to be using yeah. uh, <laughs> loudly. But yeah, even I mean, if you stop bench pressing, you get up, you walk to the cable row, then... Uh, you put in the weights, maybe someone moved it, you know, that's already... Okay. So by the time you've started, yeah. Yeah, it's then it's, you're, you're probably talking about realistically 30 seconds anyway before you're actually starting the next movement. So if you actually rest in between, then you're, you're probably going to miss the window of actual antagonist potentiation. Makes sense. And, you know, it's interesting. I've used that method of supersetting, usually with smaller muscle groups and, and just to save time, you know, if I'm doing some arm stuff or mm -hmm. some shoulder stuff, but I haven't done it. I mean, I did it in the past. I just haven't done it in a while with bigger muscle groups, but now, now I'm interested in trying it for the purposes of progressing. Now I understand if you're kind of just doing maintenance workouts and that's a lot of what a lot of us have been doing. Like I don't have a proper home gym setup. I have some Bowflex dumbbells and some bands. And so more than enough for maintenance. But when I was in the gym, not that I, I don't have much muscle and strength left to gain, really particularly muscle. I can get my strength back up to, I was getting back up to previous PR levels, but beyond that, like I was getting to the three, four, five, right? Three plates on bench, four on squat, five on deadlift. And as far as natural weightlifting goes, I, I talk about that as like, a, that's a good benchmark, I think, for most guys to strive toward. And I had gotten there close to that in the past and I was getting back to that. And so in those workouts where I was really trying to, I was working pretty hard and, you know, I was being very particular with my programming and deloading and everything. I wouldn't have thought to do something like this because in my mind, it would have been more something that's suitable to, again, I would call it maintenance training where you're, you're pushing yourself and you're working out and, but you're not expecting to progress per se, but it sounds like I'm, I'm probably wrong in that. The interesting thing is that it's harder to do uh, your sets this way with antagonist supersets or in general with yeah. like combo sets. Yeah. And there's been, yeah, I mean, I used to do the chest back workouts many years ago and it's hard. Yeah. And especially if you're seriously strength trained, uh, like you, you are basically by definition highly advanced because I, I agree that we're both basically at, at nanny max. Then there's also research actually showing that perceived exertion increases. And I think almost everyone can attest to this. Like 
when you're new, you're a novice, you can basically bounce from exercise to exercise if you're like really motivated. You don't really fatigue yourself that much because yeah. you're weak. And you know, yeah. your body basically, if you get stronger, it doesn't make it easier to lift the weight. It just allows your body to expand those resources. But it's still just more weight being lifted, which causes greater, greater metabolic disturbance, etc. So you also yeah. feel more fatigue. And then if you take highly advanced individual and you have them do, you know, in some studies you see crazy things like Romanian deadlift followed by squats. That's something that basically no advanced individual will actually be able to do because, you know, the, the level of effort that requires, if you're, you're talking not just maintenance, but like actual, you know, one rep to failure workouts, uh, yeah. that's just grueling. And even if some people can do it, it's something you, you probably don't do every single training session. Sorry to interject, but like squatting and then deadlifting after you can do it but it's yeah it's hard if you're fairly strong it's hard <laughs> yeah and also injurious because just the fatigue will impair your concentration uh your technique you're just a little likely to get sloppier and a little sloppier is fine if you're doing biceps curls but a little sloppier on the deadlift can be the difference between you know back injury and back injury is also not like knee injury where it's just like oh, i'm not going to train quads for a week but it can be debilitating for a long time but yeah, I think with isolation exercises, it's is very doable to implement and also aim for, for progression for sure. It's the big compound exercises. Yes, yes. You do see that. It's actually funny to think about this because it illustrates one of several scenarios we see in literature where perceived exertion and neuromuscular fatigue differ. So how fatiguing you feel the workout is does not correspond and actually is the complete opposite of what's happening in reality. So if you do an antagonist superset, you feel weaker because you're doing your rows right after your bench press. You're still out of breath. You're still panting, but your performance objectively is better. And you can can achieve that better performance. It's just going to feel really hard. Exactly. It's a bit um, a bit like I was going to say sleep deprivation, but that's that's a little bit different. But it's uh, it's also a point where acute sleep deprivation makes you your workouts feel a lot more effortful, but it doesn't actually impair performance. If you think about it, you know, because you haven't slept. Yeah, yeah. No, I've experienced that many times. I think if it runs on too many nights, Definitely. then of course yeah, that changes. Because it's right? going to impair your recovery. But that single night, yeah, that single night, we have I'm sure you've experienced that. I mean, a lot of people listening, I'm sure they've experienced that, where you go into the gym and you didn't sleep well, you're tired, and you think it's going to be a shit workout, and then it actually turns out to be okay. It's, it's a bit harder, but you hit the lifts you need to hit, and you're like, oh, well, I guess uh, I had it in me. Yeah, because if you think about it, it's... Your muscle tissue is not damaged or fatigued or anything. It's just, it's a mental issue. But when you have that chronically, then your recovery is actually going to be impaired. Then it's going to be a chronic issue for your progression and your gains. If you like what I'm doing here on the podcast and elsewhere, definitely check out my health and fitness books, including the number one best-selling weightlifting books for men and women in the world, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, as well as the leading flexible dieting cookbook, The Shredded Chef. So then how do you like to program your full body workouts? What are your, your rules of thumb in terms of the exercise choices? And so, you know, you were just talking about, okay, you would maybe just to save time, if nothing else, you might do an antagonist, you might pair antagonist muscles or even just irrelevant muscles. Like you might do your squat and then, or sorry, you might do your bench press and then do some calf raises or something or whatever, but you wouldn't necessarily do that with two big compound exercises. So how do you like to build your full body training? I do it uh, flexibly. So I'll string like a couple exercises together, depending on someone's equipment and their goals. They have to be unrelated because you don't want overlapping musculature. You don't want to string together like the bench press and the overhead press because those are, those are definitely going to interfere with each other. If those don't, right. then you're not training hard. That becomes like a, a press workout, basically. Yeah. And then there's like borderline cases like deadlifts and overhead press. It's like you can string them together. You probably don't want to do them right back to back, though. So you have to, you know, you have to pay attention to that, what kind of exercise there are. And then often I like to do, just to, as an example of program that I just had for clients, it's like leg curls, squats, and that's actually an antagonist superset, but flexibly. So I basically say, well, if you, you can do your leg curls and then do the squat right after, you feel up for it and it's logistically possible, then go for it. Otherwise, you know, feel free to take a bit of extra rest. It's not going to make or break mm -hmm. the program. Uh, mm -hmm. And then after that, you can do like a set of chin-ups after catching your breath, making sure that your heart rate's somewhat back to normal, but also, you know, not rushing it. 
uh, but not mm -hmm. taking as long as probably the full five minutes you would otherwise take between yeah, sets of squats. Maybe squad. two minutes or so probably would be for me yeah, after a squat. Exactly. You can do it that way. And then just doing that basically cuts your workout time in half. Like if you do the math, you write it down. Mm -hmm. Some people it's like, it doesn't click, but basically you're spending time exercising that you would otherwise just be resting. So it would be sort of wasted time. And now you're spending some of that time exercising. And as soon as you string at least two exercises together, you have overlapping rest intervals. So you basically use your rest, not just to rest the thighs and the back for your squats, but you're also resting your lats, your biceps for the chin-ups. So it's majorly cuts down your training time. And so that would be a trio, just some understanding. You would do the leg curls, and then if it was an empty gym, you might go straight into your squats. You might rest 30 seconds or so, do your squats, rest eh, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, do your chins, and repeat. Yep, exactly. So there's, there's actually no word for this in the literature because it's sort of circuit training, but there is rest in between. And it's sort of an antagonist superset because the, the first part is an antagonist superset, but after that, it's just what's sometimes called a paired set, but some researchers also call that a superset. So it's, it's, there's not really a word for that in the, in the literature. I call it combo sets. Like you're, you're just combining exercises, but you're not actively trying to do a superset, right? So was, that would be your workout? It would be X number of sets of each of those exercises, or there would be another component as well? Yeah, many of my workouts, full body workouts at least, look like usually two combos. Because with one, sometimes it's just one. Like some workouts you can ex actually design, like you just have one good exercise and all of your exercises are non-overlapping, especially if you do a lot of isolation work, which you can also do back to back really well. You know, you can do, if you have like a cable pulley, you can do lateral raises, bicep curl, tricep extension. Maybe while you're at it, you, you pick up a dumbbell, you do the unilateral calf raises. You can do all of that pretty much back to back. And that's fine. Most workouts, you have like a lot of borderline cases. If you do Romanian deadlifts, I don't really want to string that together with chin-ups, so I'll put those in like the next combo. But yeah, it can it can go either way. And like some like grueling workouts, it may be more than more than two combos, but I actually don't have that often with full body workouts. Okay. Yeah, that I'm sure that'd be difficult. And then you also that workout is gonna get a bit long as well. So if, if the point is time savings, you're gonna lose that if you if you put too much in it. Exactly. And what about how you like to order your exercises? You gave the example of starting, which would be a probably counterintuitive or it's not what a lot of people listening would expect. They would expect you to say, oh, well, do your hardest stuff first. But I'm guessing that's still generally how you like to put your workouts together. Like, I don't think you'd, you'd want to start with some chins and then end your workout with heavy deadlifts, right? <laughs> there are a couple of principles and the general rule of thumb to basically start with like the most technical, heavy, hard, effortful kind of workouts. It generally pans out that way. But there are some exceptions, like antagonist supersets. Uh, this is actually something I first learned from uh, John Meadows, and then Berg Fagli started experimenting with it. And he said, yeah, this, this actually works. Doing leg curls before your squats. And the reason they liked it is because people with knee injuries, it generally feels better and the knees, at least they aren't as painful. I'm not sure if it actually does anything for the tissue, but at least it reduces pain. And mm -hmm. I combine that with the uh, lift strong antagonist supersets, like actually cut, try to cut down the rest period as well. And you see that it actually can enhance performance in the squat and it also feels better mm -hmm. for a lot of people. I've never tried that before, but I'll have to try it when I'm back in the gym. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> overestimate quite dramatically the role of the hamstrings during the squats because muscle activation yeah. is like 20%, 20% of MVIC compared to like 100% for the quads and the glutes. So the hamstrings really aren't worked effectively by a squat. They're like, they're mostly, they are stabilizers. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And then you just use that to your advantage to, I guess, theoretically to enhance your squat. Yep. And some other useful principles are lower body first before upper body, because okay. there's, there's some research, like this is, this is not very hard data, but like some acute data on um, the, the measurement of neuromuscular fatigue suggests that lower body muscles, at least the quads, because almost all the research is in the quad, they're easy to study, suffer more from central nervous system fatigue. And that's probably not going to be a major concern in most workouts, um, but it's possible that near the end of the workout, they, they suffer a bit more. And especially exercise like squats and deadlifts, uh, anecdotally definitely suffer a great deal when you put them at the end of a workout. So I like to put those first. Good general principles also to go heavy first, because then you can actually take advantage of uh, post-activation potentiation. Whereas if you do light work first, not only do you lose that benefit, but you also do induce more fatigue. Because a lot of people... Intuitively, you may think that going heavy, as in heavy weights, like given the same training effort, is more fatiguing, but going light is actually more fatiguing. 
So best way you can think about this is just do a set of uh, just even 10 or 12 reps of squats, yeah. one to two reps shy of technical failure, and then do a set of three, same effort, one to two reps shy of technical failure, and, and that's it. You'll experience it firsthand. <laughs> exactly. And there are a lot of power lifters that still say, yeah, but there's nothing as fatiguing as the 1RM. But no, <laughs> it's, it's simply not true. Like, Just try high rep squats and lower rep squats, and the, the difference is readily obvious. And there's, there's lots of data. And it shows it as well. And just logically, I think, you know, after like 50% RM squats, you, you did like 30 reps or so, you know, how fatigued are you? You, you cannot even lift your 50% of 1RM anymore. <laughs> like after the 1RM, it just means you can't get the 1RM app anymore. But if you take off five pounds, you can probably lift that still. Yeah. So the difference is logically and empirically much, much greater. You can, like you said, you can easily feel it for yourself. So it really pays off to to start heavy and do like your higher up work later in the workout. And how do you like to periodize this type of training? And again, I'm assuming that you're speaking mostly to intermediate and advanced weightlifters at this point. I think we made that point mm -hmm. clear earlier, right? So, because periodization also, this is at least my position, my understanding of the research and, and just the anecdotal evidence is if you're new and you haven't gained much muscle and strength yet, there's no reason to get fancy with periodization. My recommendation to those people is just stick with double progression and you're going to get stronger. You're going to be adding, you're going to be gaining reps and adding weight to the bar consistently and it's going to be a lot of fun but eventually there's a point where you have to be a bit more deliberate with your periodization and obviously there are different ways to do that i have ways that i like and i think there are different ways to get to the same end result but that periodization is more applicable to intermediate and advanced weightlifters definitely that's that's generally what the research finds there's actually some data showing that in, in like rank untrained individuals excess periodization and variation in general can be harmful, probably because basically when you can still progress linearly in weights, there's just almost no way you can improve on that. You know, If you can put five pounds on the bar and lift that again next time, then you're not going to tell me that you have some fancy periodization technique that allows you not to put weight on the bar for like three workouts and then instantly put on 20 pounds because that's what you would need to do to outpace linear progression. You know, It's just not happening. So once you're past that stage, I think that daily undulating periodization is uh, the best supported research module. And I mean, objectively it is, but uh, I think it's also anecdotally, practically uh, one of the, the best ways to, to program, which basically means you have like higher and a lower rep day. And especially if you do frequent full body workouts, I like to alternate the rep ranges. So if you're working chest two days in a row, I do like to make sure that the stimulus is very different. So you want a different exercise and probably also a different rep range. So maybe Monday you do like heavy bench presses and then Tuesday you do high rep flies. Something like that. As far as DP goes, I talk about this in the new second edition of a book that I actually emailed you about. I'm not sure if you saw mm -hmm. yet, but it's called Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. It's meant for intermediate and advanced weightlifters. And I, I agree that DUP is great. And I'd be curious to, to hear your take on this. However, I think it's best suited to programs where you are performing the same exercises, or at least that's what is that's the type of programming used in the literature that best supports it. So you'd be bench pressing, let's say, two or three times a week or squatting two or three times a week, and you're going to be varying the rep ranges. And that's not to say that the principles are invalidated by changing the exercises, but one of the reasons I didn't go with DUP for that program is you are changing the exercises quite often. And my experience and my understanding of the literature, I went with a weekly undulating model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't change the exercise often. I typically just do basically the pure daily undulating periodization, which just means every time you repeat the exercise, Basically, you alternate between two, sometimes three, but generally just two rep ranges, like a high and a low rep day. Yep. So not only do I use different rep ranges for different exercises, but also when you repeat the bench press again, you do like higher reps. So like one week, I see. you have the low rep day. It is like a very straightforward DUP type yeah, of model. Yeah. I don't do much with exercise variation. There's actually a recent study on that. That's randomly doing exercises with like a an app that generates an exercise that hits the same target musculature, but with a different exercise, does not improve strength development or muscle growth. And if you look at the, the absolute numbers, the constant exercise group, they just stuck with the same exercises, or otherwise exactly identical programs did much better. Like they had over 50% more growth in all three measured heads of the quads, over 50% more 
bench press strength gain, which is makes sense because they, they bench press more. You know, if you stick with the bench yeah, press, you're yeah. going to get better on the bench press. But also for muscle growth and their BMI increased a bit more and they lost 1% body fat, whereas the random exercise selection group stayed stable in terms of body fat. So none of that was statistically significant, but I'd say that there was a, a trend that wasn't just evident in, in the absolute numbers, but is also meaningful practically. And I think that applies for many people when you start getting too fancy rather than just training hard and trying to, while that's still possible, progress linearly. Like I said, it's, it's hard to outpace that with any kind of fancy programming technique. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, even as an intermediate and advanced weightlifter, we still are just trying to add weight to the bar, but we have to do so much more work to get there. It's the main difference, right? Exactly. And okay, so you're using a DP and and do you do your heavier days earlier in the week when you're fresher, when you've come off a couple of days of rest and then you do your higher rep later in the week or do you reverse it or? It doesn't matter so much. I actually usually have non-weekly templates. So I have like a certain number of workouts that you alternate between with a certain structure. Like maybe my program will be five days rather than seven days and has like two workouts, one rest day, two workouts, one rest day, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And it just alternates. So like some weeks on Monday will be the chest day, but other weeks on the Monday, you actually have the full body day or something, you know? So in general, with programming, it's good to uh, think outside the Gregorian calendar because it can be convenient for some people, especially if you have like a weekly schedule for work and everything. So your recovery also has a weekly variation in it. Or people with kids, yeah. you know, because weekends yeah. is like kid stuff. But there's do. no need to really focus on that because it's not an actual variable that matters. You know, it's not like your body cares. It's Tuesday, like your, your biceps is like, <laughs> I, I don't, don't want to lift today because it's first day. I hate first days. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as volume, what are you shooting for? Uh, what's the range? Of, we can look at it in terms of, you spoke about an individual session. You're definitely not going to go above 10 hard mm-hmm. sets for any individual muscle group in a session. But what about weekly volume? Probably just look at it per major muscle group. It's a very wide range. So generally, it's going to be like 10 to 30 sets per muscle group per week. But I've had exceptions like I've had uh, with Nina Ross, who be- became a pro. I'd be pro naturally, you know, she's not genetically average. So at some point we had around like 60 sets, uh, so at least for like the what? glutes, uh, quads were like 40 or so. And wow. then delts were also like 30, 40 and other muscle groups were more like a moderate 20 or so. So, you know, some people, especially women can tolerate pretty obscene volumes. Other people really don't tolerate uh, that volume at all. And they'll get injured very, very quickly. Yeah. Anyone listening, I would not recommend yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even if you have the time and you have the will, I would not recommend it. Yeah, it's basically, she's the highest I think I've ever done with anyone. So, you know, that's 10 years of coaching to put it in perspective. But yeah, yeah, most people fall in more like the 10 to 30 range. Erring on the side of lower, while that still results in good progression, is is probably sensible. Some people may have have to go lower. Like I've had some Wall Street people and they have like no sleep, (laughs) chronic high stress, (laughs) <laughs> uh, so re- recovery is pretty much down the drain all the time. And then even 10 sets, uh, maybe pushing it. So you really have to look at like individual recovery capacity, how advanced they are. If they're more advanced, you can push towards higher in the range. Also very important, are they bulking or are they cutting? So are they an energy surplus or a deficit? It's not a bad rule of thumb to actually just multiply the average volume with the energy balance factor. If you go from like maintenance to 20% energy deficit, then you may also want to cut like 20% volume. Because your recovery capacity is going to take a hit. And we have at least one good study on uh, Ramadan fasting that shows that during Ramadan fasting, one group that decreased volume by, I think, 33%, depending a bit on which muscle you look at, had better strength progression. They didn't measure muscle, muscle growth, I think, but they had better strength progression than the group that stuck with the same volume they were doing before. So basically, uh, an energy deficit is a re- recovery deficit. And you can actually make better progression sometimes if you you take that into account and not not push yourself too much. Whereas while bulking, you can really push yourself to the limit more. That's interesting. The the I've never heard it put that way in terms of the deficit, the size of the deficit and the reduction in volume. But practically speaking, yeah, you should be reducing your volume a bit for sure. I mean, if you're going from a lean bulk to a cut, if you don't, you will be forced to at some point. There just will be a point where you realize all right, this is not happening. This is not working. Assuming you were training super hard before, at least, you know? 
Yeah, true, true. Is there, I'm sure there are. So what are the scenarios where you would recommend a different kind of split or maybe not? Actually, I'm not, and I, I don't think that your position is that full body is best always for everyone, but maybe it is. I'm just curious. Yeah, actually I would be, that's not my position for sure. I basically scale up frequency along with training advancements. So basically anyone that I have to do full body is like at least late intermediate, unless they're training like two or three times a week, like I said, because then full body, I think makes sense for almost anyone. But based on purely on the literature, it's actually very hard to make a case of why just always training full body is actually detrimental. Because pretty much, like I said, if you just group all of the studies together, like you don't care about any other factor, like energy deficits, plus how advanced they are, whatever, then basically the literature says, well, looking at higher versus lower frequency, we have, I think it's like 15 to 20 studies that find neutral, so it doesn't really matter what frequency you do. Then you have like six or so, let's say, either significantly or very strong trends for benefits of higher frequencies. And only one study for one out of six studied muscle groups found significantly greater progression in the lower frequency. And that was more a case of the higher frequency group just not having any biceps growth for some reason, whereas the other lower frequency group did have growth that was more comparable to all the other muscle groups. So I'm not sure if that study really should be met with, um, should have a lot of weight. Basically, the overall trend is like, it's probably neutral or beneficial. And if you also look at recovery indices, higher frequencies are generally positive. Like they're gonna increase how much volume you do. They're gonna decrease soreness. They're gonna improve your testosterone to cortisol ratio. You know, it's actually quite hard to make a case, I'd say, against doing full body. But in practice, you do see that people can end up with too high volumes and beginners, even if it's just one hard set, they may get injured or just even one hard set per day, like every day, it's simply too much for them already. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask about is there's just that recovery point is, can you recover fast enough from, because you got to strike that balance, right? Between the recovery and the amount of volume you need to do in each workout to hit your weekly volume. And so the, the question is, can your body do it, right? Mm-hmm. And so that just, again, comes down to the individual. And like you said, it's going to be more intermediate and advanced weightlifters who are going to be able to do it, right? Who don't get too sore, who basically don't walk away from, let's say, five hard sets for a muscle group with a bunch of muscle damage that's going to take five days to repair. Yeah. So I would say, though, that like I would definitely agree like an untrained individual. You don't want to have them do even one hard set a day, probably. But with there are still ways to actually make it very effective because the I think the two studies in the literature that reported the highest ever muscle growth rates, they were with blood flow restriction training, training every muscle group twice a day in untrained individuals. So at least in the short term, that can actually end with blood flow restriction training, which is it's debatable if that uh, is easier to recover from. For the joints, it certainly is. But even then, you know, it, it might work, but it's definitely unconventional and uh, requires a bit uh, different pro- training programming practices. Uh, so I'm not an advocate of it, but... Uh, and you can only do it for your limbs. I mean, so it's it's also limited in that regard. Like, yeah, that might be good for your arms. And- yeah, you can actually implement blood flow restriction training also for non-occluded muscle groups, as long as the limb is a limiting factor in the performance. Okay. So yeah, that's probably something to get into in a different podcast because I have to go in, in one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that is a, an interesting... Uh, finding in research mental note because i've only used it and spoken about it in the context of you got your arms and you got your legs there you go <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah that's a traditional way to implement it totally okay good well that actually coincides with the that was the last point i had that i wanted to ask you about so i think this has been a, a great in-depth discussion of full body training and for people who want to, if they want to do some of your workouts, for example, because I think we've done a good job covering the big moving parts, but there might be some still some questions like, all right, how do I actually turn this into a workout program I can use? Can people find some full body workouts of yours on your website or do you sell them? Or I don't really sell workouts. I just have coaching in my PT course, but you can get a lot of information for free. If you go to my website, benohensomals.com, and I'm right on the main page, there's a big button that says like free email course, put in your email, click hit, and then you get like a tour of my most popular contents, which also include training frequency and some previews for my PT course, some excerpts, just a lot of free information. Of course, after that, I'm going to teach you with like full course and everything, but that's probably the best way to, uh, to learn more about this or just search training frequency on my website because there's a ton of stuff on there. 
Okay, perfect, perfect. And is there anything else you'd like people to know about before we wrap up here? Anything new and exciting or if you want to talk about your PT course as well? No, they'll uh, they'll see all of that if they're interested and they, uh, they do the free course or browse on my website. I'm not the best salesman, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I just want to give, I just uh, always like to ask because sometimes people do have things like, oh, I do have this thing coming up or I'm about to release this new mm-hmm. thing, you know. Yeah, the one I have coming up is a, a client consult. So, <laughs> okay, perfect, man. Well, thanks for taking the time. I look forward to the next one. Yeah, it was great talking to you. And uh, let me know when this goes online. I'll be sure to share it. Okay, thank you. All right, see you. Yep. All right, well, that's it for today's episode. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. And if you did, and you don't mind doing me a favor, could you please leave a quick review for the podcast on iTunes or wherever you are listening from? Because those reviews not only convince people that they should check out the show, they also increase the search visibility and help more people find their way to me and to the podcast and learn how to build their best body ever as well. And of course, if you want to be notified when the next episode goes live, then simply subscribe to the podcast in whatever app you're using to listen, and you will not miss out on any of the new stuff that I have coming. And last, if you didn't like something about the show, then definitely shoot me an email at mike at muscleforlife.com and share your thoughts. Let me know how you think I could do this better. I read every email myself, and I'm always looking for constructive feedback. All right. Thanks again for listening to this episode, and I hope to hear from you soon.